on the master ceremony for today's event. I'm the president of the Veterans Association here at Kong, and I'm also the vice president of the ASSE Club, which is the American Society of Safety Engineers. I received my AAS in process technology back in August, and then I started the occupational safety and health program a couple weeks later, and I expect to finish that next summer. I spent 11 years in the Coast Guard, six of those 11 years I was underway, and uh, I did one tour in Bahrain during Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring, Free Enduring Freedom, and then I was medically retired in 2011. Today we have Mrs. Rosalie Kedler here with her husband Terry, if she can come up, there she is. Good afternoon. It is with pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of President Beth Lewis, the Board of Trustees, to the College of the Mainland Veterans Day Ceremony. We're here today to pay tribute to all the men and women who have served our country in the military. They are our true heroes. We need to remember their dedication, their courage, their achievements, and to say thank you, not only today, but every day, for their many sacrifices. Dr. Lewis, she's out on um, college business, but she would like to, for me to tell you that the College of the Mainland is putting a priority on academic advising for veterans at our new Veterans Center here on campus. Feel free to come by or call uh, especially if you're interested in a new career. Uh, we have many wonderful people here that can help you, um, gu guide you through that um, path. And um, so, again, thank you, veterans. Um, God bless you always, and God bless America. Thank you for that, Mrs. Keller. Okay, the uh, VFW people are not here apparently, so we're gonna go ahead and skip to the Comms Children Development Center students doing the Pledge of Allegiance, directed by Robert Castro. Thank you very much. If everybody could please remain standing. Dr. Sparky Kerner, U.S. Air Force and professor of music here at COM is going to play the national anthem.
Thank you, Dr. Kerner. Everybody can uh, be seated now. Okay, next we have Ms. Angela Dampier, Comms Executive Director of Human Resources, accompanied on the piano by Dr. Paul Boyd, a professor of music here at Com, and she's going to sing God Bless America. God bless America. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the ocean, white with foam. Thank you for that, that was beautiful. Okay, today our guest speaker is Dr. Ralph B. Duvall, Jr. He's an education coordinator in the Education Division for the Texas Veterans Commission. Before TVC, he was a Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Air Force as a chaplain. He was also the chaplain consultant at headquarters of the Air Force Reserve Command for the Yellow Ribbon Program and an individual mobilization augmentee with headquarters Armed Forces Reserve Command. Sorry, I'm losing my place here. Chief of Chaplains. <laughs> he was instrumental in the development and relaunch of the U.S. Air Force Comprehensive Airman Fitness Program in 2010. He was one of the leading subject matter experts for individual and family resilience for the Department of Defense, serving on task, task forces at the Pentagon, throughout the U.S., as well as overseas. He's spoken to over 28,000 military members and their families about resilience and maintaining balanced living. He retired from the U.S. Air Force after 32 years of service, which included three tours during Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom, and one, and one tour in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. He retired from the Department of Veterans Affairs, Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center in Houston, as the Acting Chief of Chaplain after 24 years of service. He earned a BA in psychology from the University of Illinois, an MA in pastoral psychology from the Houston Graduate School of Theology, a PhD in human services counseling psychology from Walden University, and he also earned an MBA from the University of Houston Victoria, and in 2007 was featured on MBA.com as a model student for continuing education while serving on active duty in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom earning his MBA in Strategic Management from the University of Houston, Victoria. Without any further delay, let's welcome Dr. Ralph B. Duvall, Jr. to the stage. Thank you, Thank you so much. I, you know, I, I got to shorten that. Somebody asked me last night, I was at a program, they said, did you ever take a vacation? And the truth is, no. God never takes a vacation, so I don't think he expects chaplains to take vacations. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for, uh, for allowing me to be here today. It is such a privilege. You know, th these last couple of days have been very in busy, and, and uh, last night I was at an exhibit for veteran art at Houston Community College. Just, just an overwhelming, beautiful thing. And then it's so great to be down here and to see all of you here. You know, one of the interesting things, I, I, just a little bit, <coughs> I, I went into service in 1969 and got out in 84 and then had the 
calling to go back in. And so that's why you see on my resume, Vietnam and OEF, OIF. I just, I, I just love serving. And isn't that, isn't that the way we are, veterans? We just love serving. Thank you so much. Well, it's my honor to introduce, uh, I think I know, know these folks, or at least they know me. I was just with you the other night, and John, thank you so much for being here. I want to introduce you to our panel, John Roberts. If you don't know John, John is, a, is an unbelievable person. John was uh, served in the Marine Corps, Ooh, uh, and you just had, hoorah, you just had Marine Corps birthday. How many Marines in here? Marine Corps birthday, right? Hoorah. He served in the Marine Corps from 82 to 1996 when he received a, a medical discharge following his a prolonged recovery uh, from wounds suffered in a crash of a helicopter in uh, some, the seas of Somalia at the beginning of Operation uh, Restore Hope. Operation Restore Hope was a United Nations sanctioned intervention meant to avert the growing uh, humanitarian disaster in the wake of the collapse of the government of Somalia. And you know, one of the things that I, as I, as I stop, John, and just talk about it, I've never seen a country that we will push food out at the same time we're pushing other things out. We do, we, that's, we just care that much. In uh, 1992, John suffered third degree burns, over 80% of his body resulting in a loss of uh, use of, of his left leg. His right arm was nearly severed. The doctors were able to attach the, reattach the arm. John suffers from a serious loss of use of his extremity as well. Following his military service, John wasted no time, I mean no time, uh, starting a, a, a career devoted to his fellow wounded veterans. His first job was with the DAV and working with uh, a national service as a national service off, officer. Heather, I just just met you the other day, and you get around too. <laughs> um, Heather is a veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard uh, and native Texan. Was assigned to Galveston, where she served as a yeoman and a petty uh, officer third class. Uh, she was resides in Galveston with her husband, who is still active in Coast Guard. No, he's medically disabled. He's medically disabled, okay. So he's a Coast Guard veteran, and there are two children. As a volunteer service coordinator, Melton, she will recruit and train local veterans uh, to serve as mentors to other veterans. The program will raise awareness and partners with the other veterans support groups to advocate and to provide outreach for mental health awareness to other veterans. And then Michelle, Michelle is a craft, is a is a licensed clinical social worker who serves uh, who serves as the suicide prevention coordinator at the Mike Lee DeBakey VA Medical Center. I worked there 24 years. She is one of the five specialists who facilitate the implementation of suicide prevention strategies through education, consulting, monitoring, and outreach activities. So for suicide prevention coordinators. Uh, function as advisors to, fac to facility leadership, program managers and staff concerning suicide prevention strategies for patients and facilities. So we want to thank you, our, our panel today, for being here. All right, well, so we want to open discussion. And the, first of all, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask each of the panel members to, to tell us briefly, what does Veterans Day mean to you? What does Veterans Day mean to you? Yes. Yes. Well, I just want to start by saying how much I'm honored to even sit at the table with uh, veterans and to be here today, uh, especially, and I'm not a veteran myself, but have had the privilege uh, and honor of being able to work with veterans for many years now. And 
I just can't tell you how much uh, just getting to know um, their stories, um, seeing the courage and resilience that they have as not only from the things they went through in the military, but um, also as they come out of the military and the struggles that they have and just all the strengths they have to uh, um, just change this world in amazing ways. And so, uh, and I think for me it is just, and as I've worked with the veterans over the year, become more and more thankful for what the veterans have done for us, um, for each of us, and specifically for me. And so, uh, for me, it's a very, um, becoming a more and more special day as the years go by. Well, for me, Veterans Day is mainly, um, I want to say family. Veterans are our family. We're all always sticking together, no matter what branch that we're in. And it's a good time to spend quality time with those that we care for, and we want to continue to serve them. and. Um, for the ones who have, have yet to come home, we said it's to remember them and wait for them to come and join us one day and celebrate our family as well. Uh, nothing like a tough question to start out with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Veterans Day for me, um, I probably don't need to be mic'd. Uh, that is a day, I, I think we could do Veterans Day every single day because I think we need to celebrate our veterans and the sacrifice that each one of us we're willing to make um, at one time or another. But as a country, unless it's in the media, unless it's uh, being spotlighted on this one particular day, sometimes uh, our sacrifice kind of goes unnoticed. And I think uh, if we're just gonna have one day and we're gonna celebrate those men and women that's put on that uniform, um, that's fine, it's a good reminder for the country of what people have done for them to protect their freedoms. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, anyone want to open up with a question from the audience? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Please wait for the is, it, is there a possibility that someday uh, that Veterans Day could be taught in schools to let the kids know, because you know, as we're all saying, uh, freedom is not free. It's cost. Uh, you know, it costs arms, legs, death. And is there a possibility? Because I see the youth today, but when they come out, they have no respect towards that part. It's just what's for me, and nothing for you. you know, I joined the military because of Robert F. Kennedy. I mean, John F. Kennedy. Excuse me. That's not what your country could do for you, but what. I could do for my country, and I and I volunteered on that basis, and I still do. So, can you answer that? I think Michelle, you have you you spoke up right away for that one. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Heather. I'm the military veteran uh, coordinator with Peer Network. Uh, I do want to say that there are schools out there that are working on starting programs like that. Just the other day, we were at Heights Elementary in Texas City. Um, they, they dedicate a whole week, actually the whole year, their theme is to celebrate their veterans. And it is case by case basis and it's really a beautiful thing to see. But we do have to educate our kids at home. I have a seven year old, he doesn't go to Heights Elementary in Texas City. Um, so he doesn't have that. We don't have the draft anymore so the community is not aware. We do have to get involved with our own kids' lives and take that to the school. Be on the school board and let them know that you're interested in having that at the public schools. Do you have any comments? Um, I don't know. Most of my kids have gone to school here at one time or another, and I think that's why I get drafted. Uh, my kids have the benefit of having me in the household, and they've, they've lived with it in their entire life. Uh, I do know most of the schools, Tech City, that's where I'm from, and my kids are raised, uh, and they do have a pretty vibrant veterans uh, awareness program going there. Um, I work with a lot of the younger generation um, veterans. My dad was World War II and Korean veteran, um, so I had that growing up. But I, I think you're right. It does start in the home, and we have to educate our kids about what it means to serve. Um, and I'll add something to that, too. Just being somebody who is not a veteran and that was not raised. My dad was uh, in the military for a short time, but uh, did not bring it into the home a lot and talk about it a lot. So I was not raised with that. 
And I have come to an awareness uh, since working with the veterans uh, of the lack of, um, I mean, I think everybody respects and honors veterans, but doesn't realize the level of sacrifice and how much that is connected to the freedom that we have in our world, uh, and in the United States in particular. And so um, I would say that, yeah, like you said, the, the, um, the parents, the schools, um, the media, everything really, uh, we need to hear more of that. And, uh, you know, um, I, and I have learned that respect myself by being around the other veterans and hearing their stories. I mean, I had the privilege of being in a position before this one, and this is a wonderful position that I'm in now, but I actually worked with the uh, OAF, OAF veterans and did their initial mental health evaluation. Um, and so I got to hear their whole stories from when they were in the military and coming out. And as I mentioned, just the courage and strength in them and just seeing that connection to myself and my families, my kids, my husband's life. Um, you know, and so I, you know, I just wish, I hear people saying that they don't feel like uh, some of the new um, veterans that are coming out also saying that they just don't feel like they're respected. Um, and they still, and so I just hate that that happens. And so we really need to focus on it. Yeah. I, I, I want to add because, and, and I'll get, uh, I want to add, in my role as a education coordinator for the greater Houston area, and I go all the way from Beaumont to, to Sam Houston to Stephen F. Austin to Texas A&M, one of the things that, I, and I like your question, but one of the things that uh, I have encouraged, and you, you'll be encouraged by what we're seeing and hearing, is that on all the campuses, in particular University of Houston, I walked on the campus and I said, where's your student veterans organization? And they, they were a fledgling group. And I said, you have no clout because you don't have an organization. And I have to tell you this, in the last two years, the presidents of the student bodies at the University of Houston at Central Campus have been veterans. That's the president. And, uh, and I was at a campus last night at the, the West Loop campus of Houston Community College. And the president, a wheelchair-bound veteran, and I'll, I'll mention that, was the president of the student government at Houston Community College's Southwest campus. So like them, we not only have to educate our children, but we have to as veterans, we realizing this, and I hope I'm not taking this too much, we're only, we used to be 20 and 30% of the population of the United States. We are now only 1%. So that's just some information. Thank you, I, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I served with 82nd and with the information that we're talking about now, um, I think it's very important and detrimental. We live in America, which is a democracy. Other countries almost make it mandatory for the youth to go through some type of military structure. You know, and I think you know me growing up on the south side of Chicago, on the streets, I'm the only person in my family that experienced military. And I'm telling you, it took me away from a lot of things negative. And so, you, if you look at the demographics and you look at Chicago today, you know, you had. 187 murders on Halloween, you know, 318 shootings, you know, in uh, low income areas. A lot of those kids, a lot of those youth, if they had a military experience, if they had maybe a mandatory month just to, you know, awareness of, you know, what the military can do, it actually can mature some of those kids and help the youth of America, and not just in America, on a national level, it can help, it helps youth become mature enough to, you know, to understand how to get out of different situations. And so everybody's not fortunate enough to grow up in great neighborhoods or whatever, but if you have a military structure, if you have some, some type of outlet, you know, and I think if, if it was mandatory and like maybe a curriculum that somebody could start, I think that would be a great thing to do. And so uh, it helped me. It helped me. It helped me escape a lot of different things. I grew up in the same household with my brother. They call us East and West. My last name is Germany. They call us East and West Germany <laughs> because we were so different. You know, he he chose a path, but I chose a path. When I got out of high school, I went to the military. When he got you know into some other things, you know, I became a police officer here at HPD. He went to prison. You know, as my brother, I love him. We had the same opportunities, but he, different. He, different choices, you understand what I'm saying? And so I think my military experience helped me to overcome a lot of challenges 
And so I think that I think that's a great idea. I think somebody should table that discussion across America. You know, make it a mandatory curriculum if it's just a small, just a small period of time. You know, just to give you know youth an opportunity to understand. You know. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, now, one thing I grew up in the Midwest, small town USA, and military members made up a especially the vets made up a pretty good percentage of the population there. And Veterans Day parades, Veterans Day at the school. I actually remember having Veterans Day off from school and that was the day of the parade, it was all big. And even now that I live in Dickinson, Veterans Day is still big in the school there. It is there, I don't think it's publicized as much as it should be or recognized you know, by the media as much as it should be, but I do think it's there. And, you know, I, I, I definitely bring my military home, my kids, yes sir, no sir, yes sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. You know, it, everybody knows that they've been there. You know, but I do believe that the schools are doing a pretty good job, especially in this area, because Texas has a lot of vets. This is for the panel. Okay, this is just a little added information to what these gentlemen were speaking about. If I remember correctly, there was a period of time here in America when the campuses refused to let military recruiters on the campus, and that it really hurt us. Yes. They do let them on the high school campuses now. After, after I got out of boot camp, I went to the recruiter's office, and I went to two different high schools. So they, they do allow it. A lot of high schools do it. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, many times when our veterans return home, uh, we can see the visible injuries that they've suffered. Uh, however, uh, many times some of the other psychological injuries that result from experiences or things that they have seen or have been forced to do as a part of the war um, movement, what, if anything, do we have in place to screen veterans when they are discharged. I didn't know that. I didn't and know that second part, um, once they're here, what, what kinds of uh, programs do we have in place to help identify and get them the help before they choose that option of suicide? I, Michelle, yeah, I know, yeah, I know you know that one. <laughs> So I would say first, before I go into the specific things uh, that I know personally, is that there are uh, agencies and individuals all over the Houston area, surrounded, surrounding area and around the country that um, are um, doing a lot of service in both recognition of that and, and uh, providing services, both mental health services, but also providing the things that are creating a lot of those mental health um, um, problems, you know, such as homelessness. And so there's, um, for myself, uh, since I work at the VA, we have a lot of contact with a lot of community agencies. In fact, make a lot of referrals to community agencies that help with uh, um, different things in regards to um, homelessness and uh, the different stressors somebody might be experiencing uh, problems with jobs. So we are definitely, as a team, uh, you know, the whole community is is involved in that. But from the from my standpoint. Uh, um, one of the things we have for the new, I'm gonna just gonna address for the uh, new people that uh, come are coming, uh, the new veterans. Um, the VA uh, has the our main Houston VA in this area, but we also have nine surrounding uh, in the surrounding areas. We have uh, outpatient clinics as well, where a person can come in and get care. What we do is the do an initial, um, very thorough uh, mental health evaluation. Um, trying to determine, you know, looking at both the mental health symptoms and say in regards to like depression, suicide risk, PTSD, and a lot of other things as well because it's not just those that our uh, veterans are experiencing. So we do, um, we see everybody, um, or to ask that everybody have a mental health evaluation and most people do. Um, and then we do have a large portion of veterans that are doing very well. You know, there's a, um, you know, there's just uh, that they um, are, uh, they don't have mental health uh, um, symptoms that are occurring, but we do have a significant number uh, that do. And so at that point, uh, we would 
um, during the assessment of, and my, when I was in that position, this is what I did, was I would link them with the resources uh, that they, they needed. Um, I would uh, provide uh, emergency care at that moment if it was needed, including um, consulting with the psychiatrist to come in and do a medication consultation so we could get them started on medications. Um, if that was something that they wanted and something that they needed, um, then we would work with them on that. And then we, in our OEF, OIF clinic, we also have case managers that see each of the veterans that come in, and they talk to them about the, um, the stressors they're having, which can be numerous, um, some of it doing with employment, some doing with housing, their electricity being turned off. It could be multiple things. And so we do have a case manager that tries to help them address those and uh, refer them to community or organizations um, that help with those. Um, and then I also would refer them to counseling. We have uh, a lot of a lot of different counseling um, at our agency and there are other agencies as well that have many I think Gulf Coast Center is one of them um, but there there are lots of agencies out there I think we're the um, the one thing and we were talking about um, just I have trouble link it back to the previous conversation but basically what kept going through my mind was the camaraderie of the veterans and that one of the main things that people can do as veterans is to encourage other veterans to get help. So when they see those symptoms, because the biggest uh, difficulty is, is that with the suicide risk is that there's about, um, the national average is about 22 veteran suicides a day, which is inc incredibly high. Yes. Um, I mean, it's just frightening. Uh, even one's too many, but 22 a day. And, uh, but only five of those veterans are actually in care. It's because people aren't seeking care for a variety of reasons. Um, some of it's stigma, some of it, you know, like uh, somebody mentioned the wound of, you know, not being visible. And sometimes people, the veterans will actually tell me, they'll go, well, I didn't seek help because, you know, I knew that that person that didn't have a leg, you know, they needed to care more than me. So they might be frightened there not be, might not be enough services for them. So they'll tell me those stories. Um, and so, um, but the main reason, then this is based on research, when the veterans are coming in for care, it's when their family or other veterans are encouraging them to come. So, and it doesn't matter where they come in for care because there's lots of different places for counseling. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, thank you for those questions. Yeah. There's a lot out there, but need more. I, I need want to, to ask a question of of the of uh, of uh, Heather. Yeah. Heather, in your new position, uh, what do you think is going to be the greatest? reward and the greatest challenge of your new position? Definitely the greatest reward is helping the veterans in our community. We want to do peer support and help the veterans coming back home and we have other veterans to do that. So uh, obviously that's the greatest reward is doing that. The greatest challenge is finding those veterans who need the help because a lot of times they don't self-identify. Um, also another challenge is finding, finding veterans to provide that peer support. I can provide the training to help them do that. I can provide the setting to help them do that, but I need the veterans. If they come to me, I can definitely give them the right avenues to choose. Okay, and I have a question for John. John, moving forward, as we, as we move farther and farther away from combat operations, official combat operations, what do you see is, like, like uh, the question I asked, what do you see as the greatest challenge moving as we move farther and farther away? As we move farther and farther away, you get less exposure. There's less interest from the public. Um, as an older generation vet now, and it, it's weird I say that with eight grandkids, but the kids I take care of now, and I've worked with veterans from World War II, but I've been working with this newest generation for nine years and their needs are completely different from what my needs are at this point in my life. Um, and it would be easy to say that there's not enough adequate resources in the VA and uh, I think that's true. I, I don't think you can have enough resources. Um, there's still the stigma issue. There's still, I and when you read my bio, um, it sounded like a great success story. There was a lot missing from that. And I had very visible injuries, but I also had very uh, significant uh, issues with PTSD. And I was one of those individuals that sat home, suffered in silence, self-medicated, was angry. I didn't want to go to the VA because I didn't want to admit I had an issue. 
most of the young veterans I work with now are just, they're, they're trying to figure out getting out of the military, the transition process, they're not fully prepared. Most of them can't balance a budget. Most of them don't know how to apply for school benefits. Most of them don't know how to get into the VA healthcare. They don't know how to apply for their compensation benefits. Uh, DOD's gotta do a better job helping these folks transition. But at the same time, when they get home, they're focused on feeding a young family, figuring out how to put a roof over their head, food on the table, um, how, to get a, how to go out and apply for a job. Most of them can't fill out a resume to save their lives. Um, there's a lack of training that needs to go on with this, these folks. And I remember getting out all those years ago how lost I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do now after 14 years of service and being physically injured, I had no idea what I was gonna to do to take care of my family. And, and I remember those days and I see it happening to another generation, just like it's happened to every other generation that's come back from war. And uh, we're just repeating the cycle. It's gotten better because of the sacrifices of my generation and those that came before me because of the sacrifices they went through. Uh, how the Vietnam vets were treated when they got home. This generation, my generation, definitely had benefited from the public wanting to support them coming home, but it was only because of others have, uh, they've sacrificed. And it's always been my mission to make it better for the next generation, because I've already been there, done that, and uh, now we gotta figure out how to get enough adequate mental health resources in the VA um, we need to reduce stigma on PTSD and show people that trauma is trauma, no matter if it happened to you, somebody wearing the uniform or somebody that was a rape survivor, been through a natural disaster, you name it. If you've been through something uh, traumatizing in your life, uh, if you had an abusive childhood growing up, anybody in this room potentially could develop PTSD, and that's whether you were in uniform or not. And I think we have a long way to continue to educate the public. Throw it back out to you all. Uh, how y'all doing today? I'm glad to be here. I wanted to piggyback off her, her statement. How is it that veterans fight for this country and come back and end up homeless? I myself experienced homelessness and I couldn't figure out what happened or how it happened. I mean, I went to the uh, I went to the VA and other resources to get myself out of it, but other veterans or have jobs and don't have a home to go to and didn't know those resources were available. So my question would be, how can we make that available to veterans? Because a homeless veteran to me is absurd. That's all I have. Yeah. <clears throat> well, actually I'm gonna be meeting with a group of homeless veterans tomorrow. So if you wanna come down <laughs> and help me out to assist them, I would love to have anybody willing to do that. But the problem is that there are a lot of underlying mental health issues that are untreated. Maybe they don't want to admit that they have these issues. Uh, and then on top of that, they pile on substance abuse, alcohol abuse, and then we are failing them. We need to get together and go out and reach out to them and see what we can do. And so I'm always inviting people to come with me. So come on down. <laughs> Uh, I'll get with you after the program. They asked the question, where can they find you? Okay, I'm here today, but usually I'm down at the Gulf Coast Center. Um, that's on the Strand in Galveston. Uh, you can actually look us up on Facebook if you want to. It's MVPN Gulf Coast. I have brochures for everybody here. I can add something to that, if that's okay. Um, the federal government um, does, has, I mean, there, first, first of all, I want to say that you're right, there, there, there shouldn't be one, home. that just doesn't make sense, there shouldn't want be people that have given so much to this country and uh, that, and yet they're experiencing homelessness, so I think that, that, that if there's, there's there, that should not be happening, um, and uh, what I will say to add to that is that they, they are focusing uh, quite a bit on homelessness uh, um, at the VAs. I can only speak for our particular VA, but I think it's uh, nation, nationwide. One of the best services, we have about 
100 social workers that are specifically to uh, working with homeless veterans um, and uh, that they there's a I don't know if anybody's familiar with section 8 housing but there's uh, there's actually vouchers that the, um, the federal government um, makes available to veterans that are um, similar to section 8 housing and the fact that 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 if you if if you it pays about 70% of the rent and the the veterans pay about 30 there's a certain number that come out per year and they have they have made those vouchers i think it's about 250 a year which isn't enough but it moves ahead of other people in the population that um, are also experiencing that when they're waiting for those type of fundings so the only thing i can say is is that though is that it is something that they're focusing on um, and continuing to try to build. And I think it's not just the VA. I mean, I think everybody is because I know that it is is something that uh, is just a you know needs to be. A, it's a critical focus. And so, um, I think, thank you for asking. Yeah, I just want to say uh, okay, just just one comment. We've got quick time for one or two more questions. Now, I, I want to give her, bring everybody back. This is Veterans Day. <laughs> and what we probably need to do is get the VA down here <laughs> to get some folks down. So, what? okay, and I might not want to comment on what I want to comment on because I don't because I, I wanted to t talk about the soldier on the on the corner. I uh, just said I I think that 250 is substandard. We need more training to help these soldiers coming back. That's all I want to say. I can go into a lot of other things, but what you said was right on point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. One question. One more question about. I think, I think that a lot of veterans mistrust the government and so they don't question or ask for help because of that mistrust. Yes. I know yeah. I did when I came back and uh, I never received benefits. I, I could have, but I never, uh, I never received them. I went to the VA hospital in Houston three days in a row from 8 o'clock until the close without getting an appointment. And that was when I was young, and I just forgot about it. That's it. I just do it on my own. But when you hear and you read about the Veterans Administration, how they lack the support to take care of the veterans, and how they give bonuses to each other, like today I read in the news, mm -hmm. it just came in, in the TV uh, this morning, like $10 million in bonuses. Who gets bonuses in the VA when that money should go to the veteran? Mm -hmm. yes. I mean... It's, it's just it's ludicrous, but that's the system. That's how we have to deal with it. But uh, I thank each and every one of you for uh, helping us veterans. I try. I try to employ veterans as much as possible. I'm the only outcast in my family. All the, uh, the rest of my family are Marines. I was in the Air Force, but I was a dog handler. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I was the grunt of the Air Force. But I, I want to thank you all, and, and I, I seriously do mean that. Thank you. You, you know, we forgot something. How, do we have any World War II veterans here in the audience? You bring it up. Oh, you got it? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and how about, our, how, about, how about our Korean War veterans? All right, thank you so much. Uh, because I'm in, in kind of a, in the inner circle of things that are going on, I want to tell you all something that just happened, uh, just, just recently was released. And if you are familiar with the RAND report, anybody familiar with RAND? RAND just released a report on uh, how to improve reintegration for veterans and their family members. And I, it, it, I, it's great for my heart because it said that faith based organizations are an important key to, to reintegration of veterans because you don't have faith, you don't have stigma issues with faith based organizations. So that report just came out and if anyone wants, I have some cards here, if anyone wants to get a copy of the RAND report or you want to send it out to the folks here, I'd be more than happy to do that. Yes. Okay, we have a few certificates here to hand out to uh, show our appreciation. Dr. Duvall. Thank you. Thank you.
What's it? Oh, that one. Okay, next we have a certificate of appreciation for Mr. John Roberts. Thanks, sir. Ms. Melton. Ms. Kraft. Nobody's here from the from the Children's Center, right? Thank you, Don. Okay, there you go. Can someone accept Dr. Stansfield can accept it for the child medical Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, this one's for the Child Development Center. Next, we, uh, we have Colonel Joe McPhail, who is a World War II veteran. He is retired Marine Corps. Let me give you a little background on him here. Okay, he served in World War II and Korea and was credited with 240 combat missions two air-to-air -air victories, and was awarded two Distinguished Flying Crosses, as well as 11 Air Medals. He's going to have a booth set up in the Student Center after this, but we'll go ahead and, uh, do you want to say a word or two? Well, yes, sir, okay. I would. Go for it. <laughs> I, I want to brag on the United States of America. They've done a lot for me. Uh, I started in 1941 uh, in a, what they call a civilian pilot training program that the government sponsored. And uh, then I, I loved to fly. I got hooked and uh, uh, I, I, you know, went into the service and, and uh, the government uh, did did so much for me. Uh, I ended up flying for a company here in in Houston <laughs> because of the experience of of my time in in the service. And uh, I flew for this company for 33 years and ended up with 17,000 hours of flying. And uh, even going. Uh, after World War II, I went back to college and, and got my degree and, uh, because of the government. And, and I just want to thank them. <laughs> thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Thank you. All right. And happy birthday, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure having you here. I want to thank everybody that organized today's ceremony and Ms. Dietra Lavige for allowing me to uh, be the leader of it today. I also want to send a heartfelt thank, out, thank you out to all the vets here. You know, your service did not go unnoticed and we really appreciate you. I also want to say that we all need to be mindful of the troops that can't be home for this holiday season. You know, the ones that aren't going to be there for Thanksgiving, the ones that won't be there for Christmas to see their kids open their presents. So during your mealtime at Thanksgiving and your celebration at Christmas, take a time to think about those soldiers. Okay. And every little bit helps. You know, if you see a soldier, you see a sailor walking along the street, don't be afraid to shake their hand. We're all vets. We appreciate each other. Thank you. Okay, that I believe concludes everything. There is lunch set up in the student center for anyone who wants to stop on over and Colonel McPhail has a booth set up for more information and if you want to take a picture with him, I'm sure he'd be happy to. And there's another booth over there set up in there or did they, did, 
That's it. Okay. That's it. If you have any, uh, if you don't know where the student center is, we have a couple people over here that can show you where it is. But it's right over there by the ponds, closest the building closest to the highway. So thank you everybody for showing up.